Thank you, David Wally, for that wonderful prelude. Great is thy faithfulness. Welcome. Glad you made it through the rain to chapel this morning. We're going to begin by singing, we bring the sacrifice of praise, and then we'll go right into a hymn of praise. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let us stand, please. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of our Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of our Lord. And we offer our to
have practiced yet. The Bible tells us that every kindred, every tongue will be gathered there around Jesus Christ. And here we are on a seminary campus with students from more than 30 different foreign countries, more than 30 different states, different races, different ethnic groups. Have you practiced yet this seminary year? Have you had somebody who's not from your ethnic group in your home introduce them to your children and sat down for a meal or had a cup of coffee or some dessert? Have you met to pray with somebody who comes from a different culture than you come from and learned what's going on in their world and what they're going to go back to when they finish seminary? Have you started breaking down the walls of racism and cultural divide in your own heart, it will never be easier than here. And if we as the leaders of God's church do not break down those walls here, do you think they will ever go down in the church? We just sang, the power of His name is great enough to gather every kindred, every tribe. Oh, that that would be reflected, not simply in being in class with other people, but in having fellowship, friendship, having our children playing together. Oh, that Jesus' name would be so powerful, it would happen on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Bob Stewart, would you lead us, please, in a word of prayer? Amen. Turn to somebody before you sit down and just remind them, practice, practice, practice. Thank you so much. Dr. Olford, could you come join me up here, please? You are known across the world as one of the Bible's great expositors. I wonder if these students are here trying to build an expository preacher's library. Could you tell me four or five resources that you think every expository preacher ought to have in their library? I believe that for portability, you ought to have a one-volume commentary always at your side. Alongside of that, I would suggest two special Bibles, the Nelson Study Bible with rich rich exegesis and exposition in Old Testament as well as New. I would even suggest the John MacArthur Bible. I was there at the dedication of that. He's a great expositor. You might not agree with all his views, but I think he's done a fair job, particularly in the New Testament. That's from a portability point of view. Then the pulpit commentary. To me, that's an old one, but I tell you, there are very few modern ones that have superseded the pulpit commentary. Now I'm coming to your library, because those are a number of volumes, almost, I think, uh, 15 volumes in my set anyway. Then there is the wonderful commentary that was 
edited uh, by a, a set of glorious saints who have gone on to glory now. David had that, that uh, yellow set of mine there. Just a word, is it? A word called... The Zondervan series. To me, that excels even some of the more erudite ones that have more footnotes than actual content. <laughs> and I'm talking now to men who want to be preachers down the road. And I will try tomorrow morning in our closing session to have the actual name of the two series that I'm thinking of now. But they're in my, in my library. I bring them down every time I open the Word of God after doing my own, listen carefully, my own work on the text. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, under whom I sat for a number of years in my student days, used to say that he never taught any book of the Bible that he hadn't read at least 50 times. 50 times. So do your own spade work, first of all. Then check what you discover with what others do. And if you're way out left, I should have another look. <laughs> <laughs> One more question for everybody. That's a word for preachers as they build their libraries. But all of us need to be encouraged by the stories of great saints of God. I have found biography to be one of my favorite forms of reading. And I think for every one of us, whatever our calling may be, to be challenged by the life of a great saint of God. Is there a biography that you have found encouraging and meaningful to you? My favorite biographer and his memoirs is Robert Murray McChain, to whom I'll make reference at the conclusion of our exposition today. Robert Murray McChain. He has profoundly challenged my life. In fact, Princeton University honored him. And in the theological department, there is a man I know, Dr. Cahoon, who did his dissertation on Robert Murray McChain. He only lived to 30 years of age, and yet, in his city of Dundee in Scotland, people still talk about him with bated breath. He was such a holy man. We're going to talk about him. He's the one I'll choose amongst many others who have blessed my life. Everyone knows Thursdays are a special day at our school cafeteria. We have Alice's famous red beans and rice. But tomorrow it's going to be even more special. We're going to have a book signing with Dr. Olford. The bookstore will have set up many of Dr. Olford's books. And if you would like to purchase one of those, you can. If you have one of them already and want to bring it for him to sign, he'd be happy to. But he will be available there in the cafeteria for you tomorrow to sign books. And Dr. Olford, I'm just wondering if you would mind signing my book, Anointed Expository Preaching. I had to buy it when you weren't around, and do you think I could get you to sign that for me? I'm going to sign that, but I want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I want let's, something special. let's join now in worship as we come before the Lord and prepare our hearts for the preaching of His Word. Amen. I'll do that. On a rainy day like today, we all think about going to higher ground, but our next hymn is about higher spiritual ground. 484, let's sing the first and fourth stanzas. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. As I onward bound, God bless my feet on higher ground. God lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land. A higher place than I have found, God bless my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the upper and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I pray till heaven I found, God lead me on to higher ground, God lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land, a higher place. we read 
from responsibly, if you'll turn to number 707 in the back of your hymnal, from the 12th chapter of Romans, number 707. Would you stand with me as we read responsibly? I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In one body, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, in proportion to our faith, in service, in our service, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be changed. Never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Would you turn to number 146? Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, that's it. 
help you. It's written by Roy Hestian. It's called The Calvary Road. And in that book he points out that Calvary love is the ultimate, ultimate motivation for living. And I'm going to add, for preaching. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee, hushed our hearts to listen in expectancy. Speak, O blessed Master, in this holy hour. Let us see thy face, Lord. Thy face, Lord. 
and feel thy touch of power. Amen. Turn with me to the first epistle of Peter once again. As we're turning there, let's turn on your microphone, Doctor. Over. So that we can be sure we record this. Thank you. First Thank you so much. I just thought it was on it was here on yesterday, and I just took that for granted, but you never take anything for granted. And won't it be wonderful when we get to heaven? when we happen to be tied up to speak. 1 Peter, chapter 1. And with your finger there, will you just turn the page to our text yesterday, 1 Peter 3 and 15. Let me remind you that yesterday our theme was the posture for preaching. Sanctify the Lord God. Hallow Him. Give Him His rightful place in all holiness. And then the text goes on to say, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And be ready always to give a defense to everyone, listen carefully, who asks. Professor Alan Stibbs, in the InterVarsity series of commentaries, little brief commentaries, but magnificent piece of work, Alan Stibbs wrote the commentary on Peter, and he says that 1 Peter 3.15 is the supreme soul-winning text in the entire canon of Scripture. You see, you don't own the right to say a word for Jesus unless people ask you in the sense in which you demonstrate by your life that your walk matches your talk. Your walk matches your talk. If your life doesn't demand a supernatural explanation, then you have nothing to say. You have nothing to say. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And be ready always to give a defense to everyone who asks you. A defense, a reason, a logos for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With that in your mind, turn right over to chapter 1. Peter had already written these words in preparation for the text we had yesterday. And this is what he says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope or set your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to, to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning or pilgrimage here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who, through him, believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is the word 
of the Lord. This morning we're going to consider the purity for preaching. The purity for preaching. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Understand that he's holy. And what do we mean by holiness and what do we mean by purity? I don't know any passage in the New Testament that echoes the holiness code of Leviticus like these words of Peter. Obviously, he had read and reread and read again that book of Leviticus. And remember that when Peter wrote these words, dictating them probably the year 63 or early 64, Nero had just lifted up the floodgates of savagery against the Christian community. And that's why this epistle is conspicuous by what the scholars call the persecution passages, five of them in five chapters. But throughout those five chapters, the message of holiness is fleshed out in the language of this man Peter who walked so closely with Jesus during his earthly life. And so he lays before us here what I'm calling God's call to holiness or purity for preaching. He lays it out large and logically for us to follow. And I'm going to ask you to follow a piece of close exposition here this morning so that it won't be my words, but the words of God breaking through, through preaching in this encounter with him in this spirit of worship. With that challenge in mind, I want you to consider four salient aspects, four salient aspects of purity for preaching or holiness. Notice, first of all, God's precept for holiness. God's precept for holiness. Verse 16, it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Peter takes seriously his Bible of the day, the Old Testament. And without debate or dispute, he affirms, It is written, Be holy. Hear it. God is holy, so be holy. There's no comfort zone there. There's no fuzziness of thinking there. Be holy. He had read, as I pointed out, the holiness guide in Leviticus. Those chapters 17 through 25, read them on your knees sometime. Leviticus chapters 17 through 25. And he learned two important lessons. Look at them in the text. The precept for holiness is a command that we must obey. It is written, Be holy, for I am holy. That's not a suggestion. That's a command from the eternal throne. The first law for godly living is obedience to the voice of God. Peter reminds us in the earlier verses of this chapter. Notice what he says. He says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification or holiness of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, verse 14, as obedient children, be holy. Never were Samuel's words more relevant in the church than at this hour when he said to the sinning Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. The fat of rams was the most precious part of sacrifice. It was something God was pleased to accept as the aroma and smoke went up to heaven. The fat of rams. But God's word says obedience is more important than sacrifice, or even the fat of rams. Failure to obey is sin. And sin is opposed to holiness. The precept for holiness is a command that we must obey. Secondly, the precept for holiness is a demand that we must observe. Notice what he says, verse 15, Be holy in all your conduct. That statement covers the whole waterfront. Its inclusiveness leaves no loopholes. 
When Peter quotes from the book of Leviticus, he has in mind three very, very significant passages in that book that I just want to refer to. He talks about three specifics in every life here in this sanctuary this morning. The first has to do with impurity in our lives. Impurity in our lives. Jot down Leviticus 11 verses 44 to 45. A holy God is the pure horizon to behold iniquity. We live in a filthy world. But God calls us to be holy in a filthy world. Paul states it bluntly in his letter to the Thessalonians where he says, God has called us to holiness. Not to uncleanness, but to holiness. He puts the negative and the positive, not to uncleanness, but to holiness. God hates uncleanness. Young people here this morning, if you haven't read the Old Testament, would you study Exodus 30? You know, any Levite or priest who entered the tabernacle to serve as God had commanded without washing his hands, without washing his feet, was slain before the Lord without reprieve. They were to wash lest they die. They were to wash hands and feet lest they die. That's why the prophet Isaiah says, Be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. How can I take the Bible in my hand? How can I take the posture to preach? Unless I'm clean. It's purity for preaching. The second aspect I want you to notice is Leviticus 19.4. It has reference to idolatry. We live in a world of idols. We worship money. We worship fame. We worship sports. We worship food. We worship our TV. We worship the internet. And alas, alas, the worst thing that's happening today amongst preachers in their studies, uh, apparently pouring over the Word of God on their knees in prayer, preparing, is what is now being called cyber sex. Cyber sex. And pornography is running rageful across our land today in preachers' lives through cyber sex. Idolatry. God hates idolatry. It's an affront to his holiness. You remember that when Aaron made the golden calf for Israel to worship, Moses was with God in the holy mount. And God took Moses aside and said, This people down there, the people I brought out of Egypt, the people I've redeemed by blood, the people I've redeemed by power, they have corrupted themselves with idolatry. No wonder, John, in what almost seems to be an isolated injunction at the conclusion of his first epistle says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. The third reference is Leviticus 20 and 10 and has to do with immorality. We live in a world of immorality. We view it on the screen. We see it in the papers. We hear it in foolish talking and coarse jesting. We sense the vibes around us. It's on every placard. It's on cyber sex, as we've just noticed. This loose living has penetrated the church and has become a scandal in the world. God hates immorality. The prophet Malachi reminds us the Lord God hates divorce and therefore he hates anything that induces or incites divorce. Charles Colson in his book, The Body, shares some alarming statistics on immorality. He states that the divorce rate amongst clergy is increasing faster than any other profession. Numbers show that one in ten pastors have an affair with a member of the congregation and 25% have illicit contact in sexual intercourse. 
In the light of these tremendous facts around us today, God says, Be holy in all manner of your conduct. What a challenge to you and me. I want to tell you on my face before the Lord last night, during the night, this morning, I said, Oh God, God, keep me clean to the end of my days or strike me dead before I slip. God's precepts for holiness. Number two, God's pattern for holiness. I am holy or the holy one. Better translated, verse 16. When Peter uses these majestic words, he may have recalled that momentous encounter with his Lord on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had fished all night and caught nothing. The Lord Jesus appears and says, Cast your nets on the right side of the ship. And having landed an enormous haul of fishes, even though it was a half-hearted response, he sensed a presence. He sensed an awesome presence. It was the Son of God. And in his wet clothes, by the spray of the sea, he dropped on his knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's when Jesus looked at him and said, You're going to catch men now. You've been catching fish. Only the pure can see God in power and blessing. Purity for preaching. Before that same holy presence, Job cried, I abhor myself and repent. As I exclaimed, woe is me, for I am undone. Paul cries as he senses the battle within him, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? We need to realize that in us, that is, in our flesh, dwelleth no good thing. God has condemned it, and Jesus Christ has crucified it. We're to reckon it as dead, and we are to live as unto God, and pursue holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Notice, God is holy in his person. Look at the text again, verse 16. I am the Holy One. In the Old Testament, that word holiness occurs some 830 times and has the same emphasis in the New Testament. As applied to God, holiness is described as His absolute separation from sin. God is light. In Him, there is no darkness at all. Holiness is also described as His absolute dedication to good. God is love. And Paul adds, Paul adds, love does not rejoice in iniquity. He's affirming the absolute purity, the absolute constancy, the absolute majesty of our God. God is the Holy One. God is holy in His purpose. Look at the text. Be holy, for I am holy. And Paul uses, as Peter uses, the imperative mood. And once again, it's a command. Holiness is not an option, it's an obligation. It relates to God's holy purpose for you and me. And what is that purpose? Look at it. We're to be holy as children, verse 14. We're to be holy as pilgrims. That's very interesting. Holy as children, holy as pilgrims. We must be holy as children, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but be holy. Peter's use of Hebraism here is rather interesting. Literally, we are children of the womb of obedience. We are the children of the womb of obedience. We therefore possess the very nature of our Heavenly Father. What Peter tells us in his second epistle, that we are partakers of the divine nature. We are children of obedience. We are children of holiness. That is, the life of Christ in us, the new nature. So to be holy children, we must not be conformist to the world. Not conformist to the world, but conformist to the word. 
not conformist to the world, not conforming yourself to your former lust. Paul employs the same word when he says, be not conformed to this world. I go around this country preaching and I hear people saying, now let's get with it, let's get with it, let's link with the world, let's use their methods, let's outwit them. God says, get out of it, get out of it, get out of it. Let not the world squeeze you into its old mold. Its own mold. That's Paul's great word. Be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must not allow the world around us to shape us into its mold. The world has an enormous influence upon our lives. And John describes the world. It's defined for us. What is the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. There's such a thing as worldly affections, such a thing as worldly attractions, such a thing as worldly ambitions. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're not to conform to the world. We must be holy as children. But notice we must be holy as pilgrims. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're living on earth, but our citizenship in heaven, and as citizens of heaven, we've got to reflect the nature of the Father who is holy. People must see in our lives, when they see in our lives that we have sanctified Christ as Lord in our hearts, then they ask, what makes you tick? What makes you different? Why do you have that peace? Why do you have that joy? Why do you have that sense of power? Why do you have that poise? Then you give your defense, your apologia. Then you give your theology, your logos. My third point, jot it down. God's precept for holiness. God's Pattern for holiness. Thirdly, God's process for holiness. Look at this. Therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest or set your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Verses 13 and 14. The process is spelled out. And it starts with the word, therefore. Where there's a therefore, you ask, wherefore? And he says, look back, look back. Look at your spiritual history, verse 2. Look at your spiritual hope, verse 3. Look at your spiritual heritage, verses 4 through 10. And in the light of that, in the light of that, act, act, act. And that activity has three aspects here in the text. There is a decision that we must make. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. I like the colorful rendering of the New English Bible. You must therefore be like men, stripped fraction, perfectly controlled. The language is taken from the picture of Eastern dress. Men, and for that matter women as well, with their flowing garments, but an absolute technique of the wind for the wind catches your flowing garments and tangles up your legs and makes progress impossible so he says gird up your loins take those garments tuck them into your belt be stripped and under control and go forth to live a holy life it's a call to determination I was born in the heart of central Africa I lived for 17 years under a man who was so anointed and powerful that he planted churches all across what was known as Chokwiland, translated the Bible without any of the modern techniques. He, he had a course of medical training at Livingston College, which was then in existence in England, and took out appendices Futured animals' wounds inflicted upon some of the Africans, did his dentistry, wrote hymns, 
and wondered how on earth he completed all those things. He had a motto in his life. He had a motto in his life. And I heard that a thousand times, if not two thousand times, if not five thousand times in my younger days. Stephen, my boy, determination, not desire, controls our destiny. Determination, not desire, controls our destiny. That's what he's talking about here. Gird up your loins. Be sober. Be holy. Determination. I am determined to be holy. There is a decision that we must make. There is a direction we must take. Notice, rest or set your hope fully on the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ at his revelation and be holy. In other words, Peter is saying now, see, see that progressive, that progressive movement on to glory, step by step, nearer and nearer glory until the redemption of the body. In other words, there's only one direction. It's that holy way that you must pursue. Without it, you'll never see God. It's a direction we must take. We must take that direction here this morning. Make the decision. Take the direction. But notice there is a distraction that we must break as obedient children not conforming yourselves to your former lust. What is he talking about? He says, don't let the old life you once lived. You may have been delivered from drugs. You may have been delivered from sex addiction. You may have been delivered from alcohol. You may have been delivered from all manner of things. Or you may have been delivered from rotten religiosity that wasn't regeneration. Now then, don't let that ever hold you back. Break that connection. Break that connection. Distractions of that kind are going to hold you back. Don't allow it to be so. Don't allow it to be so. But I have a fourth point I want to share with you. And possibly the most important thing I can say. It's related to what I want to say tomorrow on the power for preaching. But God's power for holiness. Here it is, God's power for holiness. Verses 22 to 25, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. What is the power for holiness? First of all, the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, not so much for preaching at this moment, but for living. But for living. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. And you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's really saying. Beloved fellow Christians here this morning, have you ever realized that Ephesians 5.18 is not a suggestion? Be not drunk with wine where it is excess. But be filled with the Spirit. That's an imperative. It's the imperative mood. Be filled with the Spirit. It's the passive voice. I don't manipulate him. He manipulates me. He controls my life. It's the present tense. Go on being filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit. Then follows the picture of the church singing and making worship and music in our hearts to the Lord. Then follows the home, husbands and wives, parents and children. Then follows the business world, the marketplace, masters and servants. Then follows the battlefield, put on the whole armor of God. Then follows the prison cell, Paul in prison saying, pray for me, pray for me, and pray in the Spirit. I can't live one day of my life with a conscience sense of the Spirit filling my life. You say, what is that conscience sense? Dr. Paul Reese, that great master of preaching and master of teaching what I call the truly holy life, used to say the sense of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that quiet sense of divine adequacy. 
I talk about it as walking under an unclouded sky with the ungrieved, unquenched Holy Spirit filling my life. Lord Jesus, just as I breathe in the pure air and exhale the foul air, so, just as a metaphor, I breathe in afresh this moment the fullness of your Spirit. I know He's indwelling me. He comes in once and forever. I never have a two baptisms or three baptisms or four baptisms or one baptism into the body once and for all. He dwells in me forever. But He needs to fill me. It's one thing of my possessing the Holy Spirit, a totally different thing, the, possess, the Holy Spirit possessing my life. Being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit produces holiness in our lives. Purity of life and fervency of love. It's right there in the text. The power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the power of the Holy Scripture. Talking to Dr. Kelly a few moments before we came in here after we had had some prayer. I said to him, I'm never, never more convinced in all the world that the supreme answer to our country's ills today and the church of confusion and chaos today is the return to anointed expository preaching. God's Word! Let me put that where it belongs. But before it can be put right in the pulpit, it's got to be put right in the heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Word produces in us what Peter calls the divine nature. We saw that already to Peter 1.4. And that Word is incorruptible. But it's also indestructible. The Word of God lives and abides forever. I said it yesterday morning. I said it again. How many of you had your quiet time this morning? How many of you said, Lord, Lord, you said it, you said it. After your great experience in the wilderness, you faith Satan said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Lord, I need my breakfast, but more important than my breakfast is my Bible. Say a word to me, Lord, for today. Speak a word to me. And then, Launch out on your studies and your assignments. My theme this morning has been purity for preaching. And we've surveyed a passage of Scripture that talks about holiness. Over 150 years ago, a Scottish minister by the name of Robert Murray McShane, 1813 to 1843, shook the religious world with his prayers, his poetry, his preaching, and supremely, his holiness. I've studied him in depth. That man brought people to Christ by standing in this pulpit silently and looking at them. There was an effulgence, a glory, a holiness which came through his very physical being. People were saved. He was a remarkable man. He passes a church called St. Peter's in the city of Dundee. At the age of four, he could recite without a flaw the entire Greek alphabet. At the age of 14, he graduated with the highest honors from the University of Edinburgh on a par with Oxford and Cambridge. If you ask, what was the secret of this man's remarkable and revolutionary ministry? The answer is his daily prayer. Nobody knew about it until they researched his hidden works in his desk after his death. You know what it was? A simple prayer. Here it is. Oh God, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. That so impacted my life that in my study in Memphis, Tennessee, at the Stephen Olford Center for Biblical Preaching, that hangs on my wall, and God is my witness. 
I never bow my head at my desk day by day or even when I'm traveling without praying that same prayer. Oh God, make me as holy as the saved sinner can be. How many of you are prepared to pray that prayer without shame, without sham, without shrinking? Would you stand to your feet and say that prayer with me this morning? Let me repeat it for you, and we're going to say it together. But oh, let's say it deeply, sincerely, and with absolute abandon in the light of the exposition I've given you on God's call to holiness. Let me say the words again. Oh God, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. By faith, let's lift up our right hand as if we were touching the pierced hand of the Savior. Let's pray that prayer together. All together. Oh God, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. Lord, make this true afresh in my life, Stephen Olford. Make it true in these beloved faculty members. Make it true in the lives of these precious men and women training for the place of your appointment. O oh God, make us as holy as saved sinners can be. We ask it for your dear name's sake. All God's people said, Amen.